Hello and welcome you live on the globe on SAPC News. I'm Sim Piwe Ngon. It's just gone after 10 p.m. Central African time. Thanks for watching. A very good evening to you and thank you for joining us. I'm Lulu Gabu. A Russian Foreign Minister, Sergei Lavrov, will meet U.S. President Donald Trump during talks with his U.S. counterpart in Washington on Tuesday. Lavrov's trip to Washington for talks with U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo comes as bilateral ties are at post-Cold War warlows strained over everything from alleged election meddling to the wars in Ukraine and Syria. Time is also running out for the two sides to strike a deal that would replace or even extend their New START nuclear arms treaty that is set to expire in February 2021. President Vladimir Putin last week offered the United States an extension on the deal without any preconditions or further discussion. Russia's foreign ministry confirmed Lavrov's trip to Washington in a statement. Well, we've asked uh, Professor John Stremlau from the Department of International Relations at the University of the Witwatersrand to join us. And uh, uh, he is on Skype in Johannesburg. Professor Stremlau, thank you so much for joining us and a warm welcome to the Globe. Thank you very much. Good evening. I mean, uh, what do you make of, uh, of, of the latest, Professor? It's very difficult. Um, Lavrov has not been in Washington since uh, 2017 when he had that uh, most controversial meeting in the Oval Office with Donald Trump, and the only coverage of it was by Russian journalists, because American journalists, Trump did not want to be part of the meeting. Very controversial. He's coming back now to meet with Pompeo, and there's a big agenda, as you've indicated in your introduction. But the relationship between Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin, as, as Nancy Pelosi, the head of the uh, the House of Representatives said a couple of days ago, all paths lead to, lead to Putin. Between Trump and Putin and the Russians is one thing, and then there's the national interest and all of the complexities of the issues like arms control and conflicts in various parts of the world that normally form the agenda. But with Trump is a wild card, so I don't really know what to make of this. So the fact that uh, President Putin last week offered the United States um, an extension on the deal without any preconditions of uh, further discussion, do you think the United States will budge? Well, who's in the United States? And, is, and, and how strongly does Pompeo and his team, such as they are, uh, work on this question? Because at the same time, you've got the impeachment hearings going on in Washington, and you have all of the other complexities of Donald Trump undermining the NATO alliance, making a big flap in London a couple of days ago. And with the Russian agenda, you've got this question of Ukraine and the war that's going on for five years. Today, Putin is meeting with Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, in Paris. That's really a hard conflict. You know, there have been 13,000 people killed there. I'd like to see an arms control agreement continued between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, but I, I, between Russia and, and the U.S. But I really don't think nuclear war is the issue. The real issue is the invasion of Ukraine, Ukraine by the Russians in 2014 and this ongoing conflict in Donbass. And Trump is very compromised, as you know, because of the big Ukrainian issue, which is at the heart of his impeachment. So it's it's really confusing. I mean, we've seen uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin, uh, you know, contrasting Moscow's troubled relationship with the United States uh, with that with what he described as blossoming ties uh, with China and uh, taking into cognizance the fact that uh, United States relations with, tr with China are at an all time low. Moving forward, what will this mean? Well, again, we 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 have this peculiar situation uh, Vladimir Putin has been in power for 20 years and he's a real pro and he's very, very tough. And as you know, he's very active in Africa now and trying to flex uh, Russia's limited muscles. China is a much more um, important global actor today because its economy is so much bigger. And Xi Jinping is also a really tough minded uh, autocrat uh, who knows what he wants to do. Donald Trump is a reality TV star. Um, Zelensky in Ukraine was a comedian before 
coming to power six months ago. How does Zelensky and Putin actually negotiate? How does Donald Trump negotiate? He seems to have this relationship with the Russians, but that goes back to the 80s and 90s when he got Russian oligarchs to help bail him out of his problems financially, the details of which we still don't know. So when you talk about the U.S. as a state actor with regard to Russia, there is this whole tradition of, of, of policy processes and priorities and and those are, are, are circumvented by Donald Trump's tweeting and his erratic behavior and his uninformed behavior. And he is the president of the United States. So um, I'm, I wish I could help you on this, but it is perplexing. If I was Cyril Ramaphosa, I would focus on other issues right now because it's very, very hard to know how this relationship is going to unfold. It is important for Africa. It's important for South Africa. But on the other hand, um, the, 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 the relationship with, with, um, with South Africa and, and Russia seems to be fairly straightforward. The nuclear deal is not going forward. But with the Americans, uh, it's a wild card when you've got uh, this, this, this rogue, uh, rogue uh, uh, president, Donald Trump. Let's take a look back at the record of uh, former President Bill Clinton, uh, Barack Obama and uh, George W. Bush, who all embraced the same set of policies towards Russia. I mean, these, these very three different administrators uh, embraced the same set of policies towards the country. I mean, they were, they were built around two pillars. Uh, you, 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 we understand A, a refusal to accept Russia for what it is, and B, and the insistence that it reformed itself to better fit the image of uh, what the United States policymakers thought Russia should look like? Well, that's a little oversimplified. Uh, I go back a long time on U.S.-Russian or Soviet relations. I used to do dialogues because I felt that the Republican right wing, this is a real irony, was wrong in, in claiming that the alliance between the apartheid government and um, uh, the United States was justified by containing the Soviet threat to Southern Africa. After the end of the Cold War, things really loosened up. But also then the Soviet Union collapsed. And so that while you had these serial um, efforts by uh, Bush and uh, Clinton and then the, the younger Bush and Obama, um, the Russian relationship has not been as important to America as it was during the Cold War. And there's been a lot of uncertainty in it, and a lot of volatility in it. But it nevertheless did try to keep on an even keel so that there weren't miscalculations. When Donald Trump came to power, he had this relationship with Russia that related to his financial dealings that none of us know. And he had this relationship with Putin that has really been very beneficial to Putin with regard to the tensions in NATO, with regard to the um, Syrian withdrawal that, uh, that, that uh, uh, Trump so, sort of quickly did and, and realign himself with, with Erdogan and Turkey. And there does seem to be this... Um, willingness of Trump to indulge Putin and his wishes to an extent that I've never seen before in U.S. foreign policy. And it's ironic because the Republicans that Trump leads always were the hardest hardliners against the Russians and the Soviets before that. So I've been a, I've been a reconciliation guy myself, figuring that they could be common ground, but you got to work at that. It's hard work of diplomacy. And Trump doesn't, it has no interest in the details. And so I, I really can't explain to you what's happening right now in that regard. I do take a point, Professor, that uh, it is actually hard work at diplomacy. And, I mean, we're fresh from the uh, NATO summit in London. And uh, President Trump's uh, three predecessors uh, are all, were also of the view that, uh, you know, NATO was the only legitimate European security organization uh, while expanding it even deeper into the former Soviet lands. Then uh, I, I suppose then it's very uh, prudent and important to start relooking South Africa, or rather uh, the United States position uh, into NATO. Well, um, NATO has been evolving, and, uh, and it, it now deals with questions like Syria. But as you know, uh, President Macron of France recently gave an interview with The Economist where he said NATO was brain dead because um, the U.S. reliability to NATO uh, under Article 5, that they will all come to mutual defense, is no longer credible. And uh, what we have in Ukraine was a, a, a Russian invasion of Crimea and annexation. That's a sovereign state of Ukraine. It's been independent since 1990. And really 
was trying to be the buffer between the East and the West. This is a fault line in geopolitics right now that's very, very sensitive and has to be managed very carefully. What Donald Trump trying to strong arm the president of Ukraine to do him a political favor, that's the source of the impeachment articles that probably won't succeed in the, the Senate because of Republicans not wanting to go along with it. But it's a very serious broach. It's been validated by several very, very credible witnesses that he did this. But then there's the background of the Mueller report, which is another 400 page report on the interference in the 2016 election. And the Russians have been very uh, clever in involving themselves in the Brexit vote, apparently, and in the certainly in the U.S. elections in 2016. No one and no one contests the facts of that except for the Democrat, except for Donald Trump's White House. But it, it is um, it is the fact uh, that uh, he probably uh, uh, did do um, uh, some sort of obstruction of justice. And we'll see how it plays out in the impeachment hearings, but it's not going to go back to the 2016 election. And yet the Russians have been um, very assertive uh, in their own interest. And um, this is of concern to Democrats like South Africa's dem democracy because uh, liberal, illiberal authoritarianism is on the rise in many parts of the world right now, including all the BRIC countries, by the way, except South Africa. All right. Professor Stremlau, thank you so much for your reflections. Much appreciated. Professor John Stremlau is from the Department of International Relations at the University of the Witwatersrand. This is the Globe and SAPC News. We'll have more news in a moment.